Hi, I'm John Popola, and you're listening to the Emergent Order Podcast. On this episode, I have a conversation with Whole Foods co-founder and CEO, John Mackey. We collaborated on my first feature film, a documentary called At the Fork that I directed and and produced with my wife and co-founder of Emergent Order, Lisa Versace. John is an incredible entrepreneur and the co-author of Conscious Capitalism, which is a book that I really recommend everyone read who's interested in the future of business and the role that business can play in society. We talk about that and many more things, and I'm excited to share the conversation with you now. All right, so John, first, thanks for coming. And I want to start off by asking you, How did you go from being a hippie in a commune to one of the, an industry titan, to somebody who's built one of a multi-billion dollar business? I mean, it's such an incredible transformation. Where does that story begin? Well, it begins by correcting the first statement. Um, I'm not sure I was ever truly a hippie. I mean, I had long hair and... I did the things hippies do, but uh, I wasn't, um, uh, you know, I was in, in school and university, so um, I don't know. I mean, I was attracted to all things counterculture at that time, so I think loosely you could have called me a hippie, but um, ne- never really hardcore. And I would never live in a commune, for the record. I lived in a vegetarian housing cooperative that was in Austin back in moved in there in 76, I think. And I moved into that co-op. I wasn't vegetarian at that time. But I moved in to, because I was attracted to all things counterculture, and I thought I'd meet really interesting people there. And I did. I met my girlfriend that I co-founded for Safer Way and then Whole Foods Market with. And I, my food consciousness was awakened when I moved into Prana House, the name of the cooperative. Um, I learned, uh, I learned about natural and organic foods. I learned how to cook. I became a vegetarian. I became the food buyer for the co-op. I was like on fire. So my, my food consciousness really awakened there. And I didn't know it, but I had found my, the meaning and purpose of my life. And I went to work for a small natural food store called The Good Food Company and uh, did that for about six months and came back to the co-op one night and was talking to my girlfriend Renee and told her that you know, I was thinking about maybe starting a store and what did you think about that? And Renee, who's one of the most enthusiastic people I've ever known, was super stoked by that idea and said, that'd be cool, macro man, let's do that. That'll be fun, fun, fun. Renee was definitely more of a hippie than me. And, and uh, so what started out to kind of be a lark or a game in a way uh, something we, you know, I was 24 then and Renee was 20 that we thought would be a lot of fun, kind of an adventure in business. Because neither Renee and I had any background in, in business. I, I studied philosophy and religion and the humanities when I was an undergraduate. I, I never took any business classes. Uh, Renee was, um, she was going to school at that time, but she was studying social sciences. And we had no experience. I mean, I worked in this little natural food store for six months. That was the extent of my experience in the retail business. Renee was delivering pizzas for Domino's back then. So neither one of us had experience. And we just, but we jumped into it with enthusiasm and a whole heart. We raised $45,000 of capital. Um, the first store was in an old house called Safer Way. And it ended up that we moved out of the co-op after about six months to save money. And we moved into the into the into the big Victorian house that we had, which is just a couple of miles from where we're sitting right now, and within a half a mile of all three of the of the iterations of Whole Foods Market. So, the Safer Way morphed into a smaller Whole Foods and a bigger Whole Foods, and now a flagship store. So, that one location has has gone from the first store is about 3,000 square feet to now over 80,000 square feet all within a half a mile of that place Renee and I started back in 1978, literally 
40, over 40 years, for over 40 years ago now, for almost 41 years ago. How, how did you raise the money, the $45,000, and how did you know that you needed $45,000 at the time? You know, I've, I've often drawn an analogy, well, we needed 50000 but we only raised forty-five. <laughs> like, close we, enough. Close enough. I mean, um, we weren't, we caught a lot of breaks early on, to be honest. Uh, we thought we needed about fifty thousand dollars to remodel the house and buy used equipment and and use cash registers we bought everything used and have a little bit of working capital and and i mean i've oftentimes said that entrepreneurs particularly young entrepreneurs are a little bit like panhandlers they're out hustling money but they're they've got a dream they're trying to realize and so they have great enthusiasm and intense intensity and belief in the in their business and their purpose of their business and Renee and I were excited about healthy foods natural foods organic foods and I mean we just we hustled our friend we hustled our friends we hustled our families and we were able to raise I mean we, I thought we needed 50 but we only raised 45 so we were a little bit short but we just tightened our belts and made a go of it I mean uh, we were very lucky I mean, in the first year, I mean, the business could have business may not have ever gotten started. We were we were working on uh, doing the store when I had some some Austin somebody from the city come down and tell us that they wanted to see our building permits and they wanted to see our electrical permits and our plumbing permits and all. We didn't have any of those things and and I went and they said, well, said, how do we get those? And they said, well, you got to go down in town and you need to talk to the city. So we went downtown to talk to the city and. They said, well, the guy actually literally said, he looked at me and he said, here's what you're up against. And he started listing all the different permits that we needed to have and that we needed engineers' drawings and architecture drawings. We were just a bunch of kids just kind of, you know, re getting our friends to do the electro electrical and and we were just we were just remodeling the house. We didn't, we didn't ask permission. We were just doing it. And the landlord, the owner of the building was okay with it. So I went and talked to the landlord, uh, an old man from um, Lebanon. And, and that guy named Eddie Joseph, who owned a bunch of properties in in, uh, in Austin at that point, and and you know he liked Renee and I. We were young and enthusiastic and just launching kind of this business. And he said he he he, he put his arm around me. and He said, John, let me tell you something. If you try to do what the city wants, you'll never get your store open. Here's what you do. They're all a bunch of bureaucrats, and they all leave no later than 5 o'clock and oftentimes earlier. Don't do any construction during the day. Do all your construction at night. Don't tell anybody. and Just open your store. <laughs> and, and, uh, and that's what we did. We stopped working during the day, and we, we, we remodeled the, the building at, at night. And, and um, we opened the store, and we never had any problems. We did have some other bureaucrats come down after we opened the store, wanting to know um, to get our health inspection passed and some other uh, licensing requirements. And that, but they all showed up, and we all paid the fines. We we never really had a building permit, and no one was the wiser. And whether that would be possible to do in Austin today, I cannot say. But I do know that if if that had, if we had been required, I, I don't think our forty five thousand dollars would have been enough. We would not have gotten the store open. We never would have gotten. It failure to launch, so to speak. So, uh, and we managed to lose half our money in the first year. We lost $23,000 in the first year because Renee and I didn't know what we were doing. Um, we just had a lot of idealism and a lot of passion and a lot of energy, and, but we're both smart and we learned from our mistakes very quickly. And we did much better in the second year. We managed to make a profit of $5,000. Renee and I were living there. We were only taking about $200 a month each out of the business, so we you were, were living on two hundred bucks. A we month were literally living on each. Yeah, but we were at a food store, yeah. Yeah. so our food wasn't expensive, and we had bicycles, and uh, uh, we were young. We had our health. We didn't have any rent. We didn't pay anything for insurance. We didn't pay anything for automobiles. Um, our food was in the store. So the business got, was renting. Was the was the business technically the 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 renter, or, or you were paying the. You're paying the rent for the to your to Renee through the business. The, no, I mean we were paying to the landlord. We paid for the the building on a monthly charge, and uh, which was just I think back then it was like fifteen hundred dollars a month. Right. 
right? right. It was back in 1978, and even though it was a pretty big house, so we had a store on the first floor. We had a we had a vegetarian cafe. It's a vegetarian store, and we had a it was a very idealistic store. In fact, we we didn't sell any. Um, we didn't sell meat. We didn't sell sugar. We didn't sell white flour. We didn't sell alcohol. We didn't even sell caffeine. We didn't sell coffee. <laughs> and it was very pure and very much in tune with our ideals. And also, we did very little business because we did manage to lose half our $45,000. We lost $23,000 the first year. As I said, we made a small profit the second year. And then we realized this business thing's not so tough. We made a $5,000 profit. <laughs> I know we need to get a bigger store because we were we were a small store and we were a competitive disadvantage in Austin at that time. What was the competitive disadvantage of being small? The, just the not being able to have as much well, products on buy, the shelves. We couldn't, buy, we couldn't buy as well. We couldn't get as good a deals on our product, which meant we couldn't sell them as cheaply. So we were getting underpriced, and we you know we just um, uh, we were surrounded by other small natural food stores. We were. There was a ton of them back then, and Safer Way was, it was a beautiful house, and we had the vegetarian cafe on the second floor, so it did appeal to vegetarians, and we, we did have a really nice little cafe that Renee ran. So we had some things going for us, and Renee and I were very youthful and enthusiastic, so we attracted kind of our own kind to the store. But I realized if we were really going to be successful that we had to get out of Safer Way and get to, a, to have a real grocery store. So we found a 10,500 square foot store that was half a mile from Safer Way that turned out to be the first Whole Foods market. And we, so we relocated almost two years after we'd opened Safer Way. And we did it. Um, we raised some more capital. That's a longer story of how we got additional money. And we merged with another small natural food store that was one of our competitors because we both had the dream of doing a bigger store and neither one of us was going to be able to easily do it by ourselves. So we merged together. That's why I've always said there were four co-founders of Whole Foods Market, although Renee and I were the co-founders of, of Safer Way. We had Craig Weller and Mark Skiles, the owners of Clarksville Natural Grocery. I've always credited them as well as co-founders of Whole Foods, even though both of them left didn't, didn't stay that long, uh, particularly Mark was only there for a few years before he left. Uh, so, but Whole Foods Market was fabulously successful. From the very first day we opened it, it and within a few months it had become the highest volume natural food store in the United States. Wow. Because we, wow. yeah, we were, um, but we, we changed the product mix. We, we weren't vegetarian any longer. Um, Craig and Mark wanted to sell meat. We started to sell beer and wine. We started to sell coffee. We sold things with sugar and white flour. We, we were a real grocery store, although natural and organic foods focused, and it just exploded. It was a good location, and we kind of lucked into a good location, and uh, uh, it, was, it was a very, very successful store. I, I know um, my, uh, my wife and business partner and our, you know, uh, Lisa, um, she, her dad is a Burger King franchisee, and, and she worked for years to get a, a veggie burger on the, on the menu. Yeah. Okay. As you know, and um, one of the reasons that that was really apparently appealing to the Burger King sort of top brass was what they called the veto factor, which was if you have a family and uh, they've got one vegetarian that doesn't want to eat hamburgers, well, then you're not going to go to Burger King because, you know, you've got one of your kids or your spouse or whatever can't eat. Did you find that that was a similar thing with offering these other products that you were kind of creating a veto factor? Sure. I mean, if you were... That was kind of, I mean, we didn't, we had a small um, contracted out little cafe there that was with friends of mine called the Martin Brothers Cafe, which made sandwiches and smoothies and juices. I So it wasn't really a place that many people came for dinners. Or but I, but I mean, even so as a grocery, grocery shoppers, shopper, you shopping. couldn't well, get the I think things that, that you wanted. W- you could, if you were a person who wanted to eat healthy foods, mostly organic, natural foods, then... We had everything you wanted. You didn't. We were one-stop shop. We were one-stop shopping for people living that lifestyle. And people used to drive in from way outside Austin. We covered all of Austin, even though it was a small, relatively small store. We hardly have any stores that small today, and out of 500. But it was um, at the time it was the biggest and best natural food store in Austin, and it just sort of pulled from the whole city. And I, I suppose that. The veto factor was there in the sense that um, 
they were vetoing other stores who didn't have as complete a selection. Yeah, I guess what I mean is right. your for shift for to including when you went from Safer Way to Whole Foods Market and you, you started to have these other products, like 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 animal more animal products and beer and wine, do you think that helped Absolutely. overcome no, that kind of veto factor? Yeah, because people, people could get everything they wanted. I mean, people might have wanted to eat organic or eat natural, but the vegetarians could get what they wanted, but the meat eaters could get what they wanted. The people that drank uh, beer and wine could get that or coffee. Uh, so we were... Uh, we were more complete. We were like a real natural food supermarket. One of the very first r natural food supermarkets in the history of the United States. I, we don't claim to be the very first. I knew of about four or five others that inspired us uh, to open a bigger store that were one-stop shopping in a way safer way wasn't. And I think that's that was the, the big idea. Let's open a, a full-size grocery store that has it's all natural and all organic and uh, and for people that want to live that type of lifestyle we'll be the one-stop shop for it I mean mostly it was counterculture people that that came and shopped with us it was the the hippie factor they was that was who our customers were and they were this is back again and this is we opened that in store in 1980 so we're talking about now 39 years ago when the baby boom generation was young this was the lifestyle that many of them, not surely not all, but a certain sizable segment embraced. And we were the, at least in Austin at that time, we were by far the best store. Safer Way, where did that name come from for those? For those? It obviously came from Safeway, except we were a safer way. They said they were Safeway, we think we were a safer way. Did you ever get any anybody from Safeway? Uh, was it were you too small to be on the radar of yeah. taking yeah, that swipe kinda, at them a little I, bit? I was I was always kind of hoping that they might do something because I thought it it generate good it would generate publicity for us and it never happened though we didn't, we weren't on the radar although back then Safeway was in Austin and it, it exited but at that time when we opened they were Safeway was doing business in. Austin, Texas. What prompted the name change to Whole Foods Market? And who, whose idea was that? Oh, well, they didn't want to be called, our partners, Craig and Mark, didn't want to be called Safer Way, and we didn't want to be called Clarksville Natural Groceries. So we started with, um, we worked backwards. We got we got Market first. I Mar thought Market was a really cool name. Well, we're a market. Well, we're a foods market, right? So what kind of foods market are we? We're an organic foods market? Yeah, but everything we sell is not organic. Or natural foods market, yeah, it's pretty generic. But whole, partly inspired, I think, at that time by a whole earth catalog, which was a very big deal back in the late 70s right. and early 80s. We said we're like we're like whole earth, except we're whole foods, whole foods market. That's how we came about the name. For several years, you know, Lisa and I moved down here about eight years ago, and when we bought our first house, uh, one of our neighbors across was a, a, a um, Walter Wakefield. Yeah, remember Walter Wakefield from Whole Earth uh, Provision. So, was, so did, were you guys neighbors? Tell, tell, cause I, uh, it was kind of an interesting coincidence that we ended up becoming friends with, with Walter across the street. I met, I met Walter. I talked with Walter because when Whole Foods went to Houston for the first time, because I grew up in Houston and, and Renee grew up in Houston, so we both had family and friends there that were, I mean, most, most of the money that we had invested in the business came from friends and family that lived in Houston. So... They really wanted to store in Houston, and we were going into a, a shopping center, and we had a new bookstop that Gary Hoover um, uh, had, had founded was going also to Houston at that time, taking over an old movie theater, and I was trying to talk Whole Earth into going, and they weren't interested at that time in moving to Houston. Although, ironically, they did move to that shopping St. Barry Shopping Center many years later. I did, get I did get it on the radar map for them. But uh, they didn't want to do it, so I said, hey, how about if uh, my friend Philip Sansoni uh, and I pitched an idea that maybe we could like do a franchise and, and uh, uh, we could do, because I thought, I thought that I loved their stores. They were, I loved everything about them. So, but... They informed us that it would cost us at least five hundred thousand dollars in inventory to get up and, and running. Yeah, and Philip and I just said, "Well, we don't have that kind of money," so that that deal died right there. Uh, for those, I think I don't know if Whole Earth Provision is exists outside of Texas. Does it? It doesn't. I don't think it does. Not 
not the owners of that particular brand name Whole Earth Provision. Yeah, and it's, yeah. but it is in it is in Texas. It's still going. It's and it started before Whole Foods, so that company is at least um, it's probably pushing fifty years. So now. for those that uh, that are listening that aren't have never seen one of these stores, how would you describe a Whole Earth Provision? Uh it's sort of um, a lot of outdoor. Um, I mean, initially inspired by, again by the Whole Earth catalog, her Whole Earth catalog that Stuart Brand founded and which was a super cool catalog of basically tools, tools and provisions that you need to go back to the land or live a, a more ecological, sustainable lifestyle. And they had cool outdoor clothing and they had hiking boots and they had uh, backpacks. And, and so back then there weren't so many dedicated outdoor shops. Right. So I think that's where they concentrated their business. But they had other things, too. They might have um, anything. In, if the stuff that showed up in the whole catalog might show up in a whole earth provision uh, company if there was a market demand for it. So they were not just over over time, they began to specialize more in apparel, outdoor apparel and, and um, tools, sleeping bags and, and backpacks and sleeping pads and things like that, boots that people might use going backpacking or camping. But back in the day, it was more eclectic than it is today. So you, you move you move in and, 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 and team up with with a rival to, to create Whole Foods Market and it just and it takes off. What's the first major scary event or obstacle that you guys encounter after that point? Well, there was, in the first year that we opened Whole Foods, after we'd become very successful, um, but nine months after we opened the store, Austin experienced a 100-year flood, uh, the Memorial Day flood of 1981 that was national news. And we knew we'd built our store in the flood zone. Our landlord disclosed that to us. And, but it was a 100-year flood flood. 100-year flood zone, and I ask, what does that mean? It means about every 100 years, we're going to have a flood that's going to put eight feet of water in your store. And I said, every 100 years? I thought, okay, those are pretty good odds. <laughs> I mean, I mean uh, I'll mean, i be dead probably before the first flood ever happens here. But the very first year, Austin had the 100-year flood, and we did have eight feet of water in the store that, that night um, on Memorial Day, that Memorial Day Eve. And Renee... The co-founder, my girlfriend, was closing the store down that night, and she literally swam out of the store. And because she called me up and she said, "She said, John, the the water's rising. What do we do? Shoal Creek's over its banks. It's it's coming up Lamar. And and what do we do?" And I said, "Uh, can you get all our bulk bags and and start stacking in front of the front door? You know, maybe we'll get a little bit of leakage in, but we'll." You know, we won't. We'll avoid it because the floor, the store had been built up on a slab that was a couple of feet above the ground level, and we anticipated, well, we never have to worry about that. We got we're a couple of feet higher than the anything else around there, but it did go over over the slab, and it kept rising. And they put the bean bags, the bean bags, and the brown rice bags, and the flour bags were all piled up, and it actually literally kept the water out about three to four feet, and then the sheer weight. Of the water, it didn't knock the uh, the bean bags down. It just broke the glass oh, wow. that were on the front doors, and it just shattered the glass, and it came flooding in like a tidal wave, a tsunami. And yeah, Renee was lucky to get out of there, but she did swim out. So it makes a good story. In fact, there's a funny story. It was on a this was on a Sunday night, and we had had a good sales that weekend, and. We didn't make a deposit until Monday, so we had Friday, we had Saturday and Sunday's business that was in our floor safe that we had anchored into the back of the uh, the office in the back of the of the store. And when I got in there, all the power had been shut off. It was night, and we we got we came in through the back way to get into the into the store from the high ground, and the water had come in, and it was only now it. It receded, and we were, we were maybe I don't know a foot of water through the store, foot one to two feet of water, and we sloshed our way in. And I immediately went back to the back to get the cash out, and we had two days of business. And this was a time, but we didn't take credit cards, and 
almost all of our business was checks and cash, primarily cash. People would, this was a time when people didn't, they didn't use credit cards. They were really leery about any kind of debt at all. And, right, right. And they didn't want to write checks that might bounce. So just a lot of people paid cash. So we had about a good weekend. We had about, I don't know, sixty or $70,000 worth of money in the safe. And most of it was cash. And, and frankly, uh, we just had a flood and we were, looked like we were pretty much out of business. So my first goal was to get the cash out of that safe. So I waded back in there, opened the floor safe, got the money out, stuck it in a, in a grocery bag, a uh, paper grocery bag, and then began to wander my way out. And on the way out, I had a guy say, buddy, what do you got there? And I said, some guy I'd never met, and he was clearly there uh, scavenging what he could, or, or a looter, I suppose would be a better term. And I said, I'm not sure there's a lot of dry space in the back. And I just filled up a bunch of stuff I saw back there and stuck it in the grocery bag. There's still stuff back there. Maybe you should go back there now and try to see what you can find. And that's what he did. He went back to the back. If he'd looked in my bag and yeah. saw all that cash, I might have been, who knows, I might have, he would have stolen the money almost surely. But we did get the cash out. And, and but we were, we thought we were, we were out of business because we had, um, we didn't have any. We had lots of insurance for fire and theft, and uh, but we did not have flood insurance, which is really you can't get flood insurance except from the government. And so we found out we didn't have flood insurance, and uh, so we figured we were out of business. How did how did it not kill the business? I mean, it must have been surely more than sixty, seventy grand, and just just to replenish everything. Oh yeah, everything. Oh yeah, of course. And the sixty or seventy grand. Remember, that's money that we'd gotten from selling inventory, and we still owed suppliers for that inventory. Usually, you had a thirty-day credit on goods you purchased back then. And so, uh, this is when I first learned something about stakeholders. Although I did not have the language for it, the Stakeholders of the business that we think of as customers, our team members or employees, our suppliers, our investors, the community that we're part of. Uh, well, we didn't die because the stakeholders saved Whole Foods. We should have died. We were dead. We were resurrected. We were like we were like Jon Snow in the Game of Thrones. We were we were dead, legally dead. And then we showed up on Monday on Memorial Day to serve, survey the damage, which was unbelievably wrecked. And we started to clean it up. I mean, that's just, you know, what were you gonna do? You start cleaning up your mess. And there were all these people in there that I recognized, but I knew they weren't, they weren't team members. They didn't, they didn't work for the company, but they were helping to clean up the mess. And it turned out it was our customers and our neighbors. They had come to shop and saw the wreck and they just pitched in and they, literally helped clean up the store. We actually hired some of them later on after we got reopened again. So they, the community came to our support. We did a, we did a benefit. Uh, um, one of Mark Skiles' uh, cousins was a very famous musician back then uh, named Dude Skiles. And I think he played, I think he played for Beto in the Fairlanes, which was a fairly famous band back then. And they did a benefit concert for us and we raised I don't know, ten or fifteen, twenty thousand dollars from that. But our stakeholders didn't let us die. Not only did the community bail us out, but our uh, team members, they still worked. We couldn't pay them. We said, if we get back open, we'll pay you, but we can't pay you for now. Most of them just worked for free, and then we paid them back when we did get open. Our um, suppliers fronted us all new inventory, although we couldn't pay them. Once they heard about it, they, uh, they fronted us new inventory. And one of them told me, a, I think, a fairly funny story that the TV camera showed up the next day, and it's it's June 1 in August. I mean, in Austin, Texas, it was really hot. We had no no power, no electricity, no air conditioning. So everybody stripped down. I mean, the guys all took their shirts off. We were in shorts, sloshing around. And TV cameras came. <laughs> there I was. It turned out I was on national television without a shirt on. And um, <laughs> one of the suppliers... You know, said, "Hey, I saw you on TV. Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna front you some more inventory. I mean, boy, what a what a what a wreck that store is. But I mean, they knew how well we were doing, and they thought we had a, we were a pretty good risk to get back open and reestablish where we were. But he said, "Hey, John, next time you go on national television, wear a shirt." <laughs> <laughs> Says you're really skinny, man. <laughs> well, it's that good vegetarian diet it was keeping you lean. 
And also this bank, uh, the bank loaned us more money. Although I'll tell you a story that I did not learn this for many, many years. I didn't learn about this until sometime in the last seven or eight years, I discovered that the bank actually didn't loan us the money. The banker co-signed the note because I was thinking they loaned the money on my signature, but I couldn't figure out why the would, bank would loan us $50,000 on my signature when my signature was completely worthless. I had no money. Every, anything I owned was in that store. And I was young. I didn't own any, anything. And in fact, the bank wouldn't loan us the money. That banker liked me and liked Whole Foods so much, he personally guaranteed the loan. Wow. And he never told me. And later on, I was talking to a banker. I, I stayed very loyal to that bank for many, many, many years until they uh, they were merged out of existence, as we know it, and that my banker left. And we were talking. I met a banker the, from those days later on, and and the banker that did this for us was a guy named Mark Monroe. And I was talking to a banker that worked at that bank, and, and he said, boy, Mark sure did love you guys. And I said, I really, I loved Mark. I missed that guy. And he said, you know, he, he's the one that co-signed your loan, right? And I said, what do you mean he co-signed the loan? Oh, the bank turned it down. He personally guaranteed that loan. And I said, you got to be kidding, really? And it's like, he never told you? I said, no, he never, never told me that. He said, well, he did. And so that's a stakeholder that cares. That's an, that's a, uh, that, and so they, and then our, also our investors kicked in another $50,000. So we, we sc scraped it together, and, and we worked around the clock to, to get that store reopened again. And it took off right where it left off. And it, and it just, like nothing had ever happened. So that, anyway, that's a long story, but um, the flood had a pivotal impact on us. It pulled us all together, taught us about the importance of your constituencies, your stakeholders. And so when I encountered the theory of stakeholders, many years later, it was like, well, that's what happened. Stakeholders, stakeholders rock. We love our stakeholders. You've got to take care of our stakeholders. You know, build that out. So when you, when you say stakeholders, for someone that's hearing that term and doesn't thinks maybe they're thinking, are you talking about shareholders, but you're not? So what, what is a stakeholder? And a stakeholder is somebody who has a stake in the business, they're vol particularly ones that are voluntarily exchanging with the business, that are, that are connected to the business. Um, I mean, a business has many constituencies it has to make happy if it's going to be successful. They're all trading with the business for their own, for their own mutual gain, but the stakeholder philosophy is if you consciously manage your business, to help make sure all your stakeholders are flourishing, you will have a higher degree of integration and a higher degree of synergy. And it's kind of one of the foundation pieces of conscious capitalism, actually. And basically, in retail business, management's job is to hire the very best employees that you can find, make sure they're well-trained, and then make sure they're happy. Because if they're happy, they will serve the customers better, and that will make the customers happy. If the customers are happy, they're going to shop more frequently your business, they're going to become more loyal to you, and the business is going to flourish, and if the business flourishes, that makes the investors happy. And so you have this virtuous circle of happy stakeholders. And if you throw the suppliers in, once you recognize, as I did early on, that the suppliers are not somebody to try to exploit, they saved us. They, If they hadn't fronted us all that new inventory, we never would have been able to get on it and get going again. And to see them as your partner and not someone that you can take advantage of. Um, and Whole Foods has always had a deep connection to our suppliers. And we realize that our success as a business has been due to the innovations and creativity of literally thousands of suppliers. So um, the stakeholders are all matter and you gotta take care of all of them. And that's been a big Does insight. Does that, uh, the circles, of stakeholders uh, vary. So when you you know you, you know in in your book Conscious Capitalism, you know you talk about the stakeholder. You talk about them somewhat in 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 like concentric circles, right? Well, you, well, you have your primary stakeholders, those who are generally the the three or four most important, the ones the ones I name. Obviously, the business exists to satisfy customers. If you can't make your customers happy, then you don't really have a business. You can't make your customers happy unless you have people working with you, even if it's just your family, if it's a family business, like a small restaurant that's family run, still, you, they've, you know, if your kids are working there and they're, and they're mean to the customer, the business is not going to flourish. So you, you need happy employees working for you that are, that, are, that are 
they care about the business. They're taking care of the business. And if you treat them well, you treat them respectfully, and you pay them well, and you help them give them opportunities to learn and grow, then you're going to have lower turnover rates. You're going to have higher... You know, in Whole Foods' case, we're a mission-driven business, so we've always tried to make sure we enlist all of our stakeholders, especially our our team members, in the purpose of the business, because then they'll they'll care more because they'll be aligned with what the purpose of the business and why it exists. So they're all important, and but then you have other stakeholders that are in the next circle of stakeholders, say the, the communities that you're part of, um, that. In Whole Foods' case, you want to be a good citizen in your communities. The community, our neighbors bailed us out. You have, I think you have responsibilities to, obviously, you're going to be paying taxes to your communities that you're part of both the city, the state, the national, uh, federal governments are all taking tax monies from you. And they're also... Um, they're also not just speaking in terms of governments, but there's larger parts of the community. There's the the parts of a community that that neither the for-profit sector the, can't really take care of very well. And so the nonprofit st- sector comes next to take care of the, to help solve social problems. And I think the for-profit sector should be in partner with the nonprofit sector to provide money as well as expertise to help make those nonprofits function at a higher level since they're idealistic but oftentimes not very efficient. So that is the in the next circle then also you have the government, you have the communities, you have the environment, you might have the media, you might have the uh, media particularly is an important stakeholder because they can make or break you depending on what they say about you. I mean, when Whole Foods was up and coming, the media loved us and said great things about us. And then when we got to be larger, they turned on us because we became a big business. And in their narrative, big business is bad and small business is good, kind of like in the uh, Jimmy Stewart classic movie, It's a Wonderful Life. Jimmy Stewart's a small building and blown. He's a community guy. They love him. Mr. Uh, Potter is the... But Mr. Potter is the big banker who uh, is greedy and selfish and exploitative. So I would say America has a love affair with small businesses, local businesses, but big corporations, they go over to the dark side. That's how, that's how the narrative plays out. I never felt like Whole Foods went over the dark side at all. I always felt like we're the same people who were doing this business before, and we try to do the right thing by all our stakeholders, but we just began to get attacked by the media. They, the narratives would not be accurate, but they didn't care because people wanted to hear bad things about Whole Foods, and they'd be happy to write bad things. So uh, I imagine that that sort of turn at some level probably started with a lot of the folks that you knew at a personal level, right? So you've, you, you came out of this uh, you know, co-op environment of countercultural folks, and here you are now becoming a kind of a capitalist. I came out of the co-op movement, and be- because I'd also been involved in food co-ops um, uh, while I was at Safer Way, and uh, uh, bef- I mean, before I mean, while not Safer, while I was at uh, Prana House, when I was living in the co-op, I got involved in the co-op movement, including the food co-ops that were there, like uh, Wheatsville and w- Woody Hills at that time in Austin, and <clears throat> I've been members in both of those, and. Ah, uh, yeah. When I started Safer Way and started t- to do food for, I mean, as they would put it, food for people, not for profit. And when I was began to try to make a profit, uh, then I, this was back when Star Wars was just launched, the first one, and the Empire Strikes Back. I was seen as I was nicknamed Darth Vader, <laughs> and John Mackey's Vader. become Darth Vader because I'd gone over the dark side. I left the 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 co-op of cooperation behind for the the devil's uh, competition and uh, greed and selfishness and profit and exploitation. And I just felt like I was the same guy I was before, um, but trying to earn a living. And I, and I didn't think that was unethical. So in a lot of ways, that's when my philosophy began to change from a, you know, I'd started out at what I would have defined myself when I was at age 23 or 24 as a democratic socialist. And, but starting a business kind of woke me up from that it was like, Whoa! This philosophy doesn't isn't true to what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm creating value for people. I'm running a business, and I'm creating jobs, and I'm creating good food for people, and I'm, I'm producing. I'm paying taxes, and I'm making donations to nonprofits. 
Why does that make me an evil person? I'm not. I'm a good person trying to do good in the world. I'm very idealistic. So I began to look around for different, uh, a different philosophy that would be more true to uh, who I am. And then I, I also was re reading business books like crazy because I didn't have any business background. Right. So that's it was in the uh, late 70s, right around. And I, I had a couple of libertarians working for me at Safeway that were always giving me books to read. <laughs> and, 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 uh, oh, here you got to read this were, man economy and no, stay like Murray Rothbard. It'll change your life. I didn't get to that one pretty late later, but I did read Milton Friedman and I read um, in the early days and his capital and, and, and freedom. I mean, and I. Um, uh, Free to Choose book that he wrote in 1980. That had a huge impact on me when it came out. But also I'd read Ayn Rand and uh, uh, didn't get to Rothbard till later, but I definitely did read Rothbard and von Mises. I read everything. I mean, there was a joke that I read everything, every book that was in the laissez-faire book catalog. And I'd get that and I'd just buy them and I'd read them. And uh, so I, I got deeply into it at a pretty early age. So if you could send yourself back to that early 80s with all of your collective reading in, in your head what would be and, and you know how how would you attempt to describe the the moral case for capitalism to your to your co-op friends who's, who were calling you Darth Vader what would you say to them I would say business is fundamentally a value creator I mean no one is being forced to trade with safer way they trade with safer way because they believe it's in their best interest to trade with safer way. We don't have a gun. We can't force people to shop with us. There's competition out there. There's plenty of competition. I have other alternatives. And the competitors are always trying to get better. We're trying to get better so that customers will prefer us. And that means you got to pay attention to your prices. you got to pay attention to your quality. you got to pay attention to your service levels. It's the competition that makes business get better. It, if business had a monopoly, then it would have no incentive to get better. And fundamentally, I began to realize, well, that's what's wrong with government. It doesn't have any competition. It has monopolies. For one reason, our educational system is not better. It's basically a governmental monopoly. They, and that's why choice in education is so important. So we have some element of competition so entrepreneurs can start schools and create better schools, like the one that your son goes to, for example. The uh, Acton Academy, started by an entrepreneur here in Austin, and I think there's like 43. There's actually now. over 150 now. Is that right? Yeah. Is that right? Yeah. So I'm really Yeah, well, there. they're moving fast. But yeah, no, I mean, it's a great example. Yeah, business is good because it's creating value for people, and it's all based on, it's ethical because it's based on voluntary exchange. Nobody has to trade with the business. And creating profits is not bad. I mean, profits are how the business reinvests into the future. Profits is, is, not the purpose of business. That's that's where the the critics of business get it wrong. They 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 argue that business exists primarily to make profits, and too many capitalists have fallen into that that the, the very critique that that the enemies of capitalism give to it, and they're saying, yeah, it's about profit. What about it? Get over it. Get over <laughs> it. And uh, but not that I think making profits are unethical in any way. I think they're good and necessary. But I don't think that's the real purpose of business. I, I didn't start business primarily to make money. I started business because I was in love with the idea of selling healthy food to people. And I was frustrated with the co-ops because they had all these other political agendas besides just selling healthy food. And I just thought I could do it better. I thought I could do better than the co-ops could do it. So I broke away so from there's it. So this, there's this misunderstanding, if you will, about profit. The other thing... Uh, that I've heard and I've spoken to a couple of sort of modern sort of Marxist economists recently is this notion of sort of exploitation of workers that profit is that it there you know wor you workers are creating the value and it's all such nonsense so so so, so, are, so make, make the case for why that's a not a that, that, that why is that nonsense well a it's nonsense because again no one's forced to work for you there's competition for workers and it's easily seen. Um, the minimum wage in the United States is $7.25 an hour, I think, or something like that right now. And uh, Whole Foods starts people at $15 an hour. Well, why don't we just pay everybody $7.25 an hour? It's all we're legally required to do. Why would we pay more? We pay more because we can't get good workers for $7.25 an hour. We have to pay more because there's competition for workers. And 
that competition bids up prices. And if you're mean to people or treat them poorly, again, they have other alternatives in the marketplace. So if you're a jerk or an asshole, you're probably not going to be able to hold on to your people. They're going to leave you for other places. So it's based on voluntary exchange. No one's being coerced to, force, to work for the business. So that's the first thing that's very seldom seen. And people say, well, they don't have a choice. Workers are going to starve to death. It's like, well, actually, they clearly do have choices and because they, in fact, leave all the time. And we're not in cahoots with all the other businesses out there trying to force wages down. I mean, uh, there's competition for workers, and if productivity goes up, that drives up the cost of the labor, and that's how progress happens in society. Otherwise, uh, you, know, if there were, you just pay as little as possible, but you, but you have to pay what you have to pay to get the best people. And so that's the first important point, one that's never, almost never discussed, because they always go back and fall back on this idea that the power is held by the employer. And it's like, actually, it's not. It's, 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 it's a competitive situation. I mean, um, G General Motors is a pretty big car manufacturer, and I don't have to buy a car from GM if I don't want to. Right. And you don't have to work for Whole Foods if you don't want to. It's competition that raises, that keeps prices down for automobiles and raises wages. And secondly, this whole idea that all the value is created by the workers is obviously, I mean, just a little bit of thought would show that's not true. It's, yes, a great percentage of the value is created by the workers, and they get most of the money. I mean, it, profits are not, um, uh, the, 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 as I think Milton Friedman has demonstrated that throughout history, the profit fund and the wage fund, basically wages are about three times bigger than the profit fund. But the reason why it's not exploitation besides the fact that it's just voluntary is they don't assign any value to what entrepreneurs do or what management does or what investors do. And that capital isn't free. No one's going to invest their capital for free. I mean, if, you're, if they loan it, then they were going to want to get a return on that loan because they could loan, they could lose it. Maybe the loan would be back. They charge interest for it. Uh, and if you're going to make an investment, you don't invest for free. You expect to get your money back plus profits over time. And it's and so it's all a voluntary system, and it's all through competition and through exchanges that is the great wheel of capitalism, of a market economy, and it sorts itself out. Is it perfect? Well, of course it's not perfect. These are processes. These are things that tend towards efficiencies over time, but then there's always disruptions, and there's always going to be, uh, there's no way to make it perfect. Nobody's smart enough to make it perfect, but when you have a market economy and you have these processes of competition and innovation occurring, it tends to work towards the collective good over time. And that's why capitalism lifted humanity out of the dirt. We were 200 years ago, 85% of everyone alive on this planet lived on less than $1 a day. That's a simple fact. 200 years later, less than 10% do. And that's on the same adjusted for dollars. We are so much better off. In fact, I find it quite ironical that People are so, so many young people are unhappy today. There's absolutely never been a better time to be alive than right now. This is the best it's ever been for humanity. I'll give you the entire history of the human race. Tell me another time you'd rather live than right now. Is it perfect? Is it a utopia? It is not. It never will be. But it's getting better. Progress is happening. And it's mostly capitalism and capitalism combined with science. And, and rationality that's lifting humanity up. I, um, you know, uh, your, your work, your, your books, your speeches, along with uh, people like Matt Ridley and, um, and Stephen Pinker have really... Who am I here? You know, they've re really, the, 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 the data on this, why do you think people are so inclined to believe that things are 
going wrong or that the rich are getting richer and the poor are getting poorer when the, the data simply doesn't support that, especially when you look at the planet. I mean, when you... It's a complicated issue, So there, but I'll give you... Uh, I mean, it's something we could talk about for a long time. Well, the first, the first one goes back, to, I think, to our evolutionary history where, look, um, if you weren't... If you didn't have fear, you didn't survive in the ancient human evolutionary past. If, if when the big saber-toothed tigers came and you weren't scared shitless and you didn't run away, well, you got eaten. I mean, and you had to be constantly paying attention. If, today, if you see a rattlesnake, you just jump up. It's kind of like, oh my God, it's a snake. And oh, it's a rattling, get the hell back. If you didn't do that, if you weren't afraid, that snake's going to bite you. Even if it's you. just a bee, which is just a tiny, yeah. silly thing. Yeah. <laughs> or a dog barking at you, you know, you baring his teeth. I mean, there, we, those are still deep kind of within our, I, I don't want to call it DNA, but it's definitely within our deeper being, our deeper consciousness. We are constantly scanning the world for threats because in our evolutionary history, there always were threats. And guess what? There's still threats today. They're just... They're not the same kind of threats. I mean, my wife and I own a, couple, a donkey and a horse out at our ranch. And these are very skittish animals. There are no predators out there. There's no predators for the horses. There's no tigers or lions or bears any place, you know, within hundreds of miles of where they are. But that doesn't mean they're not scared all the time. If they, if a, a little frog rustles, they, you know, the horses get skittish. So I think... Our evolutionary past has programmed in fear, and we're constantly worried about what could go wrong. Human beings spend a massive amount of time worrying about the future. And no matter how good it is right now, there's doom and gloom scenarios. I mean, look at what, in 12 years, we are going to, the whole world is going to be doomed. If, unless we do radical amelioration for climate change immediately. Upset everything we need to. We need to no more internal combustion engines. There can be no carbon production whatsoever. Ground the airplanes. Don't let the cows fart methane, methane out there. We are doomed, and this calls for radical action. I will say that gives a lot of power to certain people. Uh, certain governmental people get massive power when people are frightened. And it's easy to frighten people because we are susceptible to being afraid. And just watch, sometimes, I, know, I never watch the news because it's just such a downer, but if just step back and watch the news one evening for 30 minutes. And if you're not a little bit scared when you come out of the news, then you're watching different news than, I ever, than I've ever watched because it's, it's basically all the things that are going wrong everywhere in the world. Why is it that, that's, that they do that? Are they diabolical mean people? No, that's what tunes people in because people are so fear addicted. They want to hear about all the bad, scary stuff that's going on because that gets them to tune in and they can, their, their minds can grind on that anxiety. So anyway, the first big issue is fear and anxiety are sort of endemic to the human condition and, and we need to become more conscious to transcend that to a certain extent. Not completely. You need to be afraid of a few things, but most of the fear that things people are scared of are strictly in their minds. They're not actually out there in the real world. So people are worrying constantly. I, I have friends that if you solve one of their problems, they just go to the next problem. <laughs> they just worry, worry, worry. And, there's an, and it's a kind of addiction. And it's really what most people live their lives in fear. I have no other way to put it. Italian mothers are especially good at it, let me tell you. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's, it's Italian mothers are, are the tip of the iceberg there. So that's the first thing. And... The, the second thing is, is the, people don't like this when I say this, I always get challenged on this, but I'll stick with it because um, I, I think the facts are right. And is Deidre McCloskey first really kind of brought this to my attention when I read her amazing trilogies on the bourgeoisie virtues and bourgeoisie dignity uh, and uh, the third book, Title Escapes. Yeah, bourgeois right quality, I think. quality, I think. Yeah, exactly. We had, we had Deirdre yeah, on for an uh, interview. Oh, yeah, I love Deirdre. I love her work. In the entire history of humankind, there's all been almost been no period where business people have not been held in disdain by the intellectuals. Intellectuals don't like business people. They don't like commerce. They don't like capitalism. The universities are 
that's the hotbed for Marxism. That's the hotbed for anti-capitalism because that's the hotbed for where intellectuals are. And it's almost never been not that way. In the, in the ancient days, or the, if you go back thousands of years, the business people created envy through their wealth and they were persecuted. If they were a minority like the Jews, yeah, they've been gonna say. the greatest business people of all time, except for possibly the Chinese. The Chinese and Jews, wherever they've gone, have been very successful in commerce. And if you talk to Jews who know their history, it's like, well, we went into business because they wouldn't let us do anything else. Right. We, right. We, we know we were the money lenders and the money exchangers because all these other trades were Yeah, the you know, diaspora kinda... was like, okay, well, you're not one of us, so go go lend money because we already hate those people, so we'll hate, you know, we hate you and we well, hate them, so go do it's, that. It's an, inter- it's an interesting history, but um, the bottom line is, is that, as, as McCloskey points out in her work, there was a brief period of about 50 years when, you know, from the Wealth of Nations, when Adam Smith published The Wealth of Nations until probably Malthus and Ricardo, maybe it's a less than 50 years, maybe got 35 or 40 years, where for a brief period of time, at least in England and in France, the intellectuals were favorably disposed towards business. And they saw it as a, a way, escape from poverty and progress. And, and from monarchy, and from right? Monarchy, I mean, that was a big right? part of that. Mm-hmm. Part That's of a good too. point. Were, it, was, it, was, it was used to break the, the hold that the monarchy had on the, the enlightenment, the, the reason and rationality. And, and so there was this brief period of time where at least they were less hostile towards commerce and business. And that's when the genie got out of the bottle. That's when the Industrial Revolution happened. That's when we began to make uh, progress on a sustained basis, really for the first time. And that's why humanity is... Capitalism was was unleashed. It was, it was like a genie that was let out of this bottle, and after about 30 or 40 years, they've been trying to stuff it back in the bottle ever since. But the genie is out, and, and, and so what we have going on today, when I look at the radical left, is they are desperate to stuff the genie back in the bottle and stop capitalism because it's creating inequality of wealth, and uh, which uh, they think is is unjust. Un- and in some cases, it is. In some particular instances, you you know, there's bank bailouts and things like that. I think well, everybody. Sure. Well, sure. There, if crony capitalism, if 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 government is uh, uh, exchange for campaign donations, is you know giving special favors to business, then I definitely think that's 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 ill-gotten gains, but that's not that's not through voluntary exchange for mutual benefit. So anyway, it's those two reasons, the tendency to fear combined with intellectuals' disdain for commerce. Combine those two, and you have crazy, crazy stuff happening, which is a, not that I worry about it too much, but if I think about it, I'm worried someday I'm going to get really old, and the, um, the millennial generation is going to basically uh, put me in jail and steal everything I've ever my entire yeah, life. Don't, don't watch and don't don't spend any time <laughs> watching um, Middlebury College or Evergreen State YouTube videos because they'll make you uh, they'll make you build a bunker real quick <laughs> or move out of the United States. I um the uh, one of the things that is so interesting about. The, you know you're you're such you're so passionate about capitalism and you've had this incredible life experience of experiencing what business can do and yet you've got you've actually had debates with um you know Milton Friedman who in, in the 20th century is arguably maybe the most famous you know free marketeer um on on the purpose of business and 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 so tell me about those debates like what 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 was Milton Friedman's um, position that you were debating, and 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 how did that how did that go? Did that go? Sure. Well, for t- first of all, Milton is one of my intellectual heroes, so uh, I admire him tremendously. And he's passed on, so he cannot he cannot answer these debates any longer. So, in some sense, it's always easy to debate somebody who's dead because they can't respond. Um, but we did have a. A debate in Reason magazine back in the I don't know 200 2000 uh, Milton passed I think in 2004 um, or 2005 so it was or 2006 yeah. I think this debate occurred in like 2004 or 2005 and also involved T.J. Rogers from uh, semi uh, who was a hardcore libertarian uh, entrepreneur from from Cypress Semiconductors and 
What I realized about in my business experience was that business was fundamentally this force for good in the world, and and yet it was treated very disdainfully by the intellectuals and misunderstood constantly compared to a sociopath. Yep. All they care about is money. These people are not to be given trusted. They just they they will they're greedy and they're selfish and they're exploitative, and. I always felt that the defenders of capitalism, partly influenced by Ayn Rand, but also Milton Friedman in certain ways, they fell into the trap that the Marxist and the enemies of capitalism had set, which is to, they didn't fight back on an ethical basis. I mean, Rand tried to fight back by basically shifting the ground and saying, yeah, yeah, we're selfish. And selfishness is good, the virtue of selfishness. And that was like yeah. very now, semantics. I've had many debates with, with it's it's partly semantics uh, because she's trying to argue that self-interest, the virtue of self-interest, which I agree, there's a virtue to self-interest. Selfishness, if you just look at what it means in the dictionary, it it means an overweening concern with the self and not caring about anybody else. You cannot build a society based on selfishness. I mean, you cannot. You certainly can't have a functional family with that. If our basic, if selfishness is, if 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 it's, we can get away with whatever we can get away with and not get caught. We are, we are. Nobody's going to want to live in that society. I certainly would not. Uh, and but not to get into a, a Randian debate at this point. The main point that I was trying to make is that um, that's what the critics say, and don't give them the first move. Business is good. It is creating value for people. It doesn't. And it doesn't have to defend itself in that sense. And it, don't fall into the trap of agreeing with the critics. Yeah, it's about money and profits. The only social responsibility it has is to make money. Well, that's what so the this critics This is the say. maximized shareholder value theory of the firm, right? Yeah, right. exactly. And I guess because I started. Whole safer way and then Whole Foods because I was interested in selling healthy healthy food to people. That was what drove drove us from the beginning and still drives us today. And because I'd had the near death experience with the flood, I realized that all the stakeholders matter, not just the shareholders. The shareholders matter, but they're not the only ones. They all matter. And I thought if if you reframe this, if people could see what I see, that business is the great value creator in the world, and that it creates value for everybody, not just the shareholders. Yeah, it's a win, 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 win. It's, it's wins a win, all win, around. win, 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 win. Exactly. That's a better way. It's true, and it's a better way to explain it. So that's what the debate was about. And at the end of the day, I mean, Milton agreed with me. He 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 didn't. He said, "Well, the, he just took for granted that what I was saying was true." It's like, "Well, everybody knows that," and it's like, "Well, no, everybody doesn't know that, and everybody doesn't believe that," and so. What Milton was trying to protect from when he when he would say the only social responsibility of business is to make make profits, he was trying to keep people from stealing the shareholders' money. Basically, we got to protect the shareholders here because we live in a quasi society at that point when he's defending it that tends towards socialism, tends towards a high social welfare state, and profits do matter because profit accumulation reinvested is what drives the economy forward. So his intentions were good. He's trying to protect. But the dialogue had shifted in terms of the way people were thinking about it. So I was basically arguing for a reframing of the answer to purpose, stakeholders, and... Um, conscious I, capitalism. I, and conscious capitalism. And I do think business has social responsibilities beyond the shareholders. We absolutely do. It's like... Um, we live in a much more integrated society and... And it's it's that we have we shouldn't use the business just to fulfill our own personal beliefs in the world, whether whatever they may be, your own good causes or your own. That's an abuse of the business unless you own it. You're a, they're right. We are stewards of the wealth of the company, but. I mean, I think philanthropy, for example, should be strategic. It should be something that uh, creates good in the world, but also is a win-win-win for the company. So it creates good brand equity. Uh, Whole Foods has three foundations, for example, and without going into every all three of the foundations, I'll just I'll do a couple of them very quickly. The Whole Planet Foundation, it it's it's dedicated to ending poverty on the planet through microcredit loans to 
entrepreneurs, mostly poor entrepreneurs, and we're in doing that in 67 countries now. We've helped over 5 million people since we started that program about 12 or 13 Was years this inspired ago. by the um, um, Yunus yes, and the microcredit? Yes, credit? absolutely. We started, it was he involved was, in helping with setup? Absolutely. So. Mohammed Yunus was one of my uh, heroes, and he, he's the entrepreneur that created the, the basic framework of this and uh, won the Nobel Peace Prize for it back in 2006. And so he was an early inspiration and, and and we started working with them initially, but then we moved uh, past just Grameen. There were other other microfinance organizations that we work with around the around the planet, and that's been very good. But it's not just been good for the people that we've made these when we make these loans in places where we're already trading. These are we already have a connection to those communities. We're not just doing it uh, randomly. We're doing it places where Whole Foods is already trading, and. I don't know of anything we've done that's gotten our team members more excited. We have a volunteer program where team members can go into those communities and do some type of service to them. It's so good for young people to do that. They, they get a bigger picture of the world. They're doing something to make the world a better place. They, they just, there's an awakening or quickening of consciousness when they do that. Um, it's very good for the morale of the organization. The customers like it. Uh, it, it generates positive goodwill with with. Uh, the communities that we're part of. Uh, it's just win, win, win all around. I don't, and it's clear, just in the publicity alone, it's worth the amount of money that Whole Foods has been put in it. But on the, when you consider the team and morale and the goodwill that creates with our customers, it's it's been one of the best strategies we've ever done. A second one we do is we call the Whole Kids Foundation. And this is basically working on the health of children in our school systems. So we've now given away uh, over 7,000 salad bars and about over 5,000, maybe 5,500 gardens now. We'll set up, give a free salad bar, we'll set up a garden for, for these, because we found we kids need to eat more fruits and vegetables, basically. Yeah. They eat junk food. And they, they, they their, their health is suffering as a result. Grade E or grade F ground chuck tacos and hot dogs. Oh, yeah. it's, it's, it's been a, it's basically been a, um, a, dumping, a dumping ground for various the food industry to dump this food they and that's a great a great example of crony capitalism where they they get they get the governments to um, because they control the schools to make their school lunch programs have all of this food that um, isn't necessarily good for the kids but it's kind of their excess production in a way so from dairy products to, to meat to, you know, the fast food industry to various, you know, junk food. That's what you get in the schools. That's what I was available in my school when I was growing up. And it's still what's being sold in the schools. So um, that's been incredibly good for, again, all these different stakeholders. The, our customers love to support that. Our team members are enthusiastic about it. Anybody that has any kids in school thinks, well, that, that's what Whole Foods should be doing. People want corporations to care, and corporations that don't do anything are just seen as basically uh, they fall into the trap of the of the um, of the critics. That they're just money profit machines, and they're they're just soulless machines. That all they want to do is extract as much wealth out of society as possible. I don't think that's true of corporations. Even if they don't, they're not philanthropic. They're still value creators. But they're falling into the trap of the critics, and it, and, and, and it harms capitalism. It harms business reputation in society, which is very low. If you look at the polls, big business has a 16% approval rate. We're doing a very bad job of marketing the goodness of business in the world. The um, And it's ironic, right? I mean, you, you felt the need to add, add this um, extra adjective conscious to capitalism and there's always been this debate among uh, classical liberals and libertarians about the having inherited Marx's critical term because in a way capitalism as a term to describe this free exchange market economy is a you know, you, it's focusing on only one part of it in, in a certain sense. It depends on how you define capital, right? right? We don't use capital just for economics any longer. There's intellectual capital. There's emotional 
capital. There is social capital. Yeah. These are these are words in our language now. So capitalism today, maybe when Marx made it up, it was strictly financial capital, and it had that pejorative connotation to it. Today, there are all these different kinds of forms of capital and business in a sense. So in some sense, capitalism now has is a quite appropriate word for what business it's is doing like in the world. It's almost like capabilityism in a way. Exactly. Now, McCloskey, Deidre McCloskey, came up with a term that I happen to really like. Uh, she called it uh, innovism, but I think uh, I think innovationism is actually a better term be, than. And if that ever caught on, I'd be a big supporter of it because, in a sense, what 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 we think of capitalism is just constant innovation, innovation, innovationism that leads to a lot of failures, but then a lot of successes and replication and iteration on that. And that's how progress happens through innovationism. We can really see that today in the tech world, where, I mean, it's just astounding what's been invented in the last 30 years, in my opinion. But then you can pick almost any 30 years in the last 200 years, and it's astounding what was invented in that 30-year period. It's just the process of evolution, right? I mean, when you think about it, uh, this, this sort of top-down technocratic planning of the economy is is a kind of economic creationism that you know which has always been such a such a funny thing that it's intelligent, it's intelligent design. design right we're going to have intelligent design by the kinds of people that we didn't like in high school for being social climbers <laughs> well i think what the intellectuals don't like is you're right they want to be the designers so they have sort of godlike um, aspirations as if anybody would be ever smart enough to actually design an economy that worked. It's be, I mean, it's been tried and failed again and again and again and again and again. But it's hard for people to believe that, what do you mean nobody's in control of the economy? That's, remember the first thing we talked about, fear? Right. Right. Oh my no God. No one's at the wheel. Scary. No one's got their hand nobody's on the nobody, tiller. Nobody's at, you know what? I think when, maybe when we get automatic cars, and those cars work, and people are getting in these automatic cars and driving around, it's like, okay, who's at the wheel? Well, uh, actually, maybe they'll say somebody still designed that. Nobody designed the economy, basically, and, and that scares people. Who's, who's going to stop the Jeff Bezoses and the Bill Gates from just accumulating all the money in the entire world? There, I think there's a book out now that's bestseller that I call I haven't read it, but called uh, "Winner Takes All," and it's this idea that inequality is going to continue because the rich people are going to keep stuffing all the money in their pockets, and people are going to get poorer and poorer and poorer. It's fundamentally not true, but it it sells really well to the left in the political spectrum because that's what they want to believe. These bunch of greedy bastards are just taking all the money. It, there's a fixed pie. And they come in and cut the biggest piece of pie for themselves. And then they actually steal other people's pieces of pies, too, because they're so greedy. I want to, in the time we have left, expand our circle of concern, as, as, a, as you've, you've, um, you often say, and uh, something mm -hmm. I've, I've uh, really learned a lot from you on. And that, and that is, you had a different conversation with Milton Friedman, and I'll enter this subject through that, which was about the morality of eating animals. Tell me, recount that story for me. You want to hear that story? Yeah, I, it's, it, it's, it's awesome. And so we've spent some, some time talking about Milton, and I just found, found this to be such an interesting thing. I, I do recount that story. It'll give me a, a time to plug one of my books. In the Whole Foods Diet, in Chapter 13, I recount that story. So, uh, But the story goes something like this. Uh, I became, I'd been a vegetarian for a long time, but became an ethical vegan back in the year 2003. And I don't have to go into too many details of how that happened because that's a whole other story, but let's just grant that I became an ethical vegan in 2003. And again, it was about 2004, 2005, where I uh, had the debate with Milton, and also I had dinner. My wife and I took Milton and Rose, his wife, out to dinner in San Francisco. And mutual friends, uh, I, think, uh, I think Bob Chittister arranged that dinner who's done great yeah, work the, with this Free to, free to the Choose. producer of the Free to Choose PBS series. Yes, exactly. And who's a really good guy that's done a lot, of, a lot of good for the freedom movement. So anyway, he arranged that meeting. So my wife and I are picking up Milton and Rose at their, at that time, their apartment in Russian Hill in San Francisco. It was 2004, maybe. Uh, and 
we go up, they give us, we have drinks. Uh, we're going to go to this vegetarian restaurant, famous vegetarian restaurant in San Francisco called Greens. And we're going to go there for dinner. And we're picking them up. Milton, we have the drinks. He shows me his Nobel Prize in economics, <laughs> which was uh, uh, it's not a super impressive thing except for what it stands right, for, right? right? And I was duly impressed. And, and then he asked me, he said, so John, why are you a vegan? And it's like came out of the blue. <laughs> and, and it's like, well, I thought about it for a second. And I said, I'll tell you what, Milton, I know that you, you know, you have a very, you have a very keen mind, and uh, I'm going to make an argument with you. And if you can answer the argument, I will stop being a vegan. But if you can't answer it, then I expect you to follow the logic of the argument and become a vegan yourself. And he thought about that for a second. And he said, hey, I'm on. Let's do it. <laughs> so I, I said, well, there, it's a syllogism, and there are basically four parts to the, to the argument or the syllogism. The first one is, if you eat animals, the animal necessarily has to die. There's just no getting around that. The animal's going to die if you eat it. And 99% of the animal foods that you eat in the United States were raised in factory farms. And... That, and these animals had very terrible lives. They were, they, they didn't get to roam around. They, they were crammed into into small pens or cages, forced to eat not food that's natural to them, but to gain weight. Uh, the sanitary conditions are terrible. It's it's. I'm happy to show you the stuff what they do in factory farms, and and he but he knew about factory farms, so he said and so. Anyway, number one, the animal has to die. And in most cases, more than 99% of cases, they had pretty terrible lives before they did die. Number two, um, you don't need to eat animal foods to be healthy. In fact, the correlation between heavy animal food consumption and both heart disease and cancer are extraordinarily high. All the longest lived peoples on the planet are mostly plant eaters. I mean, these, these are just the facts. Uh, uh, whether you can eat a little bit of animal food, you'll be fine. You eat very much animal food, you're, you're, you're not going to live as long, and you're not going to be as healthy, and you're going to clog up your arteries, and you're going you're gonna to probably get cancer. And these are just statistically overwhelming uh, information there. And you, and you can eat a, if you eat an intelligent plant-based diet, you will have vibrant health, and you will, and it, you, sure, you can't eat a junk food diet, but a vegan diet, but if you eat a healthy, w w whole foods, plant-based diet, you will, you will probably have maximize your lifespan and minimize your diseases, uh, which, by the way, I have experienced that in my own life, right? So I'm particularly now later at age 65 and my health's so vibrant. It's like, gosh, this really does work. I've proven it to myself again. And well, again. we went hiking together and I thought I was going to vomit by the time I got to the top of the hill and you were still trucking along. So I can attest to that. Uh, that, that had to do with my higher fitness level. But. <laughs> Plenty of meteors can run me into the ground at age 65, but not that many 65-year-olds can. The third part of the argument is is that the, the only reason we eat animals is it's just that's our culture. It's what we learned to do. Our parents taught us to do that, and it seemed normal. And our fr everybody eats that way. As our friends do it, so it's kind of part of the culture. We don't even see it. We just take it for granted. And the unpleasant stuff we just push out of our minds, you know. Yeah, most kids don't even, they, they don't know. I, I know a lot of small children when they finally find out that that's a dead animal, that that chicken's a dead, yeah. that, that was a chicken they saw. They don't want to eat it They're horrified. Anymore. What do you mean a hamburger, hamburger is a cow? Is a cow. Yeah. yeah, exactly. To them, it's just something you get in a package in a grocery store, right? So, but it's culture. And they're, without going into detail about how that culture probably evolved over time, when I mean, humans just didn't have enough food to eat and Animals were a food you could raise and keep around until you were ready to eat it, and you weren't at the mercy of the seasons. It's probably one of the reasons domesticating animals, particularly for food, became so popular, because it was a survival mechanism. Fourth, um, can you justify the necessary death of these animals, mostly who had horrible lives, uh, and you don't eat it for your health, just because it gives you pleasure to eat it and because your friends are doing it. You know, you've, you've learned to like the taste of animals, so you're, you're doing it for pleasure. Can you justify that? And I said, Milton, I can't justify it, so I'm a vegan. How do you justify it? Oh, my God. Silence. 
stops in the room. There's just silence for about two or three minutes. Milton's trying to figure it out. And then he looks at his watch. He says, oh my God, we got to go. We're going to be late to the dinner. So then on the drive over to the restaurant, <laughs> the wheels are turning. Very, turning. The wheels are turning, but he's very quiet. He's just saying, I take a ride here at the next line, and then we'll take a left up there. And in about 10 minutes, we got to the uh, restaurant. And we go into the restaurant, and we sit down, and they, they pass out the menus. And I'm thinking, ah, Milton's, Milton's not going to answer the question. I've, I've stumped him, but he's not going to answer the question because he's not, you know, he's not, not going to change the way he eats. He's 92 years old. And um, all of a sudden, completely unexpectedly, Milton Friedman stands up and he throws his menu down on the table. He just tosses it on the table and he looks at his wife of, God, 70 years and says, Rose, I cannot answer John's argument to my satisfaction. From this point forward, I have decided to become a vegan. <laughs> That's pretty funny, but what was even funnier was what happened next. Then Rose stands up. And she gets her menu, and she throws it on the ground. She throws it on the table, too, and she says, Milton, don't be utterly ridiculous. We're 92 years old. It is too late for us to become vegans. And that was, and we laughed, and that was the end of the conversation for that evening. And, of course, did Milton Friedman's intellectual integrity carry the day, and did he become a vegan for a while for the rest of the remainder of his life, or did his wife of 70 plus years win the argument. Since I've lost virtually every argument with my wife in my <laughs> 29 years of, of, of marriage, probably she, she, she persevered. But um, it's still a good story and uh, prepared to change his diet of 92 years, basically, because he heard a good argument he couldn't answer. That, that told me a lot about the man's character and integrity. When I first met my wife, Lisa, uh, she the first thing she told me was how she got the Burger King veggie burger on the menu, and then she told me how excited she was about Whole Foods Market. She didn't tell you, she didn't tell you first that you're a pretty cute guy, or anything. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, the way she'd tell the story is I had a girlfriend at the time, and and uh, but I she didn't even realize that when I, the first time I saw her, I was instantly I instantly sort of fell head over heels, and and that that relationship I had didn't last very long after. But um, she had. She was obsessed with Whole Foods Market, and she said, uh, "We've got you've got to buy stock." And I think they're going to merge with some other company that I can't remember now. It might have been it wasn't Wheatsville that's still around, but Wheatsville's a co-op. Right, right. Wild Oats is maybe what it was called. We yeah, we did we did acquire Wild Oats. Yeah, so this was two thousand two thousand and seven, and the government tried to stop it. By the way, right, because you were a monopoly <laughs> of because Whole Foods was a monopoly. It's like saying I'm a yeah. you're a monopoly, you're a monopoly of, of organic groceries, which is not in market. It's like there's the food market. <laughs> it's like being a monopoly of yourself. <laughs> yes, <laughs> Apple is a monopoly of sellers of iPhones. It's like by definition, it's just a tautology. That's exactly, that's exactly correct. So, um, so she was she was that influence on me, but it took a long time. And um, so when we when we decided to start our business and move to Austin, one of the things she was excited about was this is this is going to be amazing. We're going to be in the home, the found the, of of Whole Foods. Whole Foods. someday, we have to find, we have to get to know John Mackey and do some kind of creative project. And you and I first really met. You mean I was set up? <laughs> it was all set up. So uh, you know, you and I first. You know, we actually had a brief meeting uh, at a Freedom Fest in Las Vegas before this, but right. we were going out. We were in the, the airport together, mm -hmm. and um, and I think Gary Hoover, who um, you've known for obviously a really long time, we were heading to Freedom yeah. Fest. Yeah, saw me. I'd met Gary separately, and and, and said, "Oh, you got to come and meet, you know meet John and hang out." And we started to hang out together, and um, and you know, you said to Lisa. You're a vegetarian and a libertarian. You, you know, we're in a very tiny, very tiny club here. These two overlapping. Yeah, not, yeah, not too many libertarians or vegetarians or vegans. Most of them are uh, the other way. They're paleo, low-carb people. Right. And so uh, over the course of about a year, we got we got to, got to know each other more. And you started to hatch this plan with Lisa to make a film um, about the way animals are raised for food, which was something that... Um, and, and the morality of it, and we didn't, f uh, you know, I, I, I was aware of it through Lisa, and Lisa was obviously, this was the deep passion of her. She's always been an ethical vegan because of the treatment of animals. We were working with the Humane Society and kind of put it out to bid, and you guys won the bid. The, so the film is at the fork, 
And it is one of the proudest things I've ever done in my life to be part to have participated in that project together with you, John. Um, you know, just talk, talk, like t talk about what that experience was like for, for you, um, to, to see this process of, uh, make, you know, this was your first movie project to be involved in and, that probably my last one. <laughs> Doing documentaries, not not the most profitable endeavor, but there's the old joke of, um, you know, how do you become a millionaire? Start with a billion and start making movies. <laughs> right. <laughs> Unfortunately, that is all too often true. But um, yeah, what was, you know, I just I'd love to, you know, we never we never we haven't talked that much about your just the the, the experience of the process together. Well, I mean, you guys did all the work. All I did was kind of give the big idea that people needed to see uh, the whole continuum of the way animals are raised because there are the factory farms, but that's not who Whole Foods is buying from. And we've cultivated, there's a movement for a more uh, conscious or more higher degree of animal well. I don't want to call it humane. That drives people crazy in the animal rights movement. I want to call it humane treatment of animals, but we'll just call it there's a movement for higher degrees of animal welfare than the factory farms. That there's there is a continuum and increasingly as people become more cautious they may not decide to become vegetarians or vegans, but they do want to eat animal animals that don't that were not in factory farms were were not sort of tor tortured, that that had a a good life until the, their, they had one bad day of their life, the last one when they were slaughtered, and even that done in a, in a relatively painless way. Uh, there is a, st a strong movement in the culture to um, for people that are not willing to become vegan or vegetarian to have a higher, a source of a higher welfare um, animals and that's in a lot of ways what Whole Foods is focused on. We're focused on selling f foods for plant-based people but realizing that's a small percentage of the population. I did not want to go back to safer way days again because that's just, I tried it. I tried being a vegetarian store. There's just, it's just not a big enough market. You can't, every, you can't do what you need to do to, um, to sell healthy food to people if you're, you have to meet the market where you find it basically and you can move it a little ways but only as far as it's willing to move. Something that people are not in business do not understand, and I'm constantly criticized by people who've never done anything in business and don't ever have to meet a market or satisfy a customer full of righteous indignation and judgments about how business people are unethical. Or, I mean, practically, I guess this is a little bit of a rant. It's okay, I'm rant away. Off topic, rant but away. I mean, Whole Foods is attacked by activists Seemingly every day, new activist groups attacking us for whatever. And you've been personally you've been accosted, been personally accosted, accosted in, in circumstances. Oh, yeah. circumstances. I mean, a lot of the latest attacks are about they want Whole Foods to guarantee that our entire supply chain is, you know, climate change compatible. That um, that 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 they want us, you know, when we do business with about thirty thousand different companies, and they want us to basically police them. And if they don't, if we're not willing to do that which is an impossible task, really, um, other than you make requests, then they're going to attack us. You know, Whole Foods, give us F grades. Whole Foods not sustainable, but mostly because we're just not doing what they want us to do. And so, but Whole Foods is doing a lot in animal welfare, and hence I thought doing a film and showing some of the, of the higher welfare farms, which the film does a wonderful job of doing, uh, and showing, you know, from from White Oaks pasture farm and what they're doing with pigs and the way they're the way they're being pasture raised to to chicken layers. You show all the different aspects from the factory farms, like where we have um, Craig Watts and his uh, factory farm chicken farm and his disillusionment with that. And, and you show the whole spectrum. The film is an excellent film. It's well made. You and Lisa have a great dialogue in the film <laughs> with you being uh, more skeptical and Lisa being more of a true believer. And, you know, you go you go to kind of in a journey into American's heartland. So it's a really good film. And uh, I thought you guys did a great job of portraying sort of the continuum and to the factory farms. And we actually, 
you can't show the very worst factory farms because you can't get in there to film it. You showed what you could, but it's still, even the worst stuff you showed, there's still stuff that's a lot worse than yeah, that. Yeah, I think, I mean, our pitch to you at the time, uh, to you and to, to, to the folks at the Humane Society of the United States was, look, we're not hardcore vegan activists. Uh, well, or you could say like Lisa is more that than me, but I really believe in um, trying to present this spectrum in the way that Milton Friedman would, right? In a way of, of uh, assume people have good intentions and that they're in their circumstances for, for reasons that aren't, that are complex and let's meet these folks where they are, these farmers. And, and it, it was a, I, the, one of the things that it, that I encountered as, as I went out to these larger um, more, farmers, more industrial, more industrial, you know, was you know. that they were in a kind of bunker mentality to engage in the subject because of how often they'd had their uh, facilities, um, you know, sort of uh, shown in the worst possible light because people sneak onto their farms and whatnot. And I think that while there's a value to that, that whistleblowing, I think that there's a, there's a real value to it because there is abuse beyond the standard practices. I think what most people don't realize, and I didn't appreciate until we made the movie, was if you just show the standard practices, which is what we do in the film, mm -hmm. they're pretty, un they're pretty unacceptable, un unacceptable. They speak for themselves. To, to, most, to, to most, most people's eyes. Most people see it and they're horrified. They've been desensitized to it in a way it seems very normal to them and doesn't seem bad to them because they're desensitized to it, but you show it to people who don't know too much about it and they're horrified. Part of it is, John, is I think that the animal foods industry's done a, I mean, they always show happy cows and happy pigs and, and uh, it's mostly kept out of sight. These are in sheds and buildings that people never see and it's, it's against the law. You, you, you have a lot of states have what are called ag gag laws. You're not allowed to say negative things about it. You're not allowed to show films about it. They're basically wanting to, because the agricultural has gotten government to pass laws to protect their their interests, in a sense. So um, I think your film did a great job of exposing some of that, but also showing people that there's an, another way, and including all the way to being vegan, because they're the vegan, you know, uh, uh, that voice got heard as well. I think uh, one of the things that was so impressive to me about what Whole Foods represents, because we really scoured the landscape and we did so very independently, and we put together a team that looked at all corners of the marketplace and, and of the agriculture industry. I mean, we we got in and you know, we interviewed Terry Branstad, who's who was the governor of Iowa and is, yeah. you know, a big booster a big for booster. the way the status quo. Yeah, and he, he was a real character. Whole in the Foods film. has played a role that's almost that's that I think a lot of people, especially skeptics of capitalism, I think this is perhaps one of the most interesting instances of of a private company doing something that if you believe capitalism is just this exploitative system, you really have to try to grapple with this, which is. Whole Foods create creates a has created a um, a rating system and a, and a gov a kind of governance system called the Global Animal Partnership to um, raise the bar. Right. Right. And you're not a government. You can't enforce this, and yet you're as a private enterprise trying to raise the bar for for this for for these creatures, these animals that have no one else to uh, to to defend them, and in 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 even even folks who are deeply skeptical of um of of markets but but are, care about animals everybody i met in in this movement so far they almost sound like libertarians when they talk about the way the government interacts with the food system, food system. yeah and so you know this sort of theoretical idea that well you've got these market failures and that's where government comes in i mean in agriculture there's government failure and you you guys at whole foods market are trying to come in to correct that in a way to t talk about like how globe how this came about like what is global animal partnership and and how did it come how did it come about as a concept because it was a real it's a really interesting thing to endeavor to take on as a as a as a as a business well that came about after i you know that's when i had my food awake my consciousness awaking about um how badly animals were being exploited back in 2003 uh as a 
as activists were boycotting one of our annual meetings at Whole Foods, not boycotting it, they were protesting. And uh, I ended up in dialogue with one of the activists and, and she challenged me to learn more. She said, you don't know very much about this topic and you should, you're running a big, pretty big company. So the summer of 2003, I, I read about a dozen books on animal agriculture in the United States and I had my consciousness raised. I was very horrified by what I saw and I thought, oh my God, I, she's really right. And we could do more. Whole Foods should we, should, we should take more responsibility for this. We need to do a better job. So we called in the activists to work with us. We work with the activists along with um, farmers and with animal scientists. And then Whole Foods was there. And we would bring people together on a species by species basis to talk about how we could set standards for a better degree of welfare. And then I guess my big idea was. Instead of it being an all or all or nothing rating like you have with organic, it's either organic or it's not, or fair trade, it's either fair trade or it's not. Uh, it's like there are these. Once you get that certification for organic and fair trade, you don't have any. You have no incentive to get better. It just stops at the minimum required to get the certification. So I was thinking this is a continuum, and if we can have different higher degrees of welfare, then we'll incent people to make. If you set it too high, the bar too high, nobody can make the transition. And if you if you don't set it high enough, so that it's easy to get certification, no one has incentive to get better. So what I saw is that if you rate these things, you know, just like uh, we rate restaurants, we rate movies, you rate books on Amazon, humans are rating things all the time. Why not rate animal welfare? And then people have a guide that, okay, well, this meat is the higher standard, highest standard we sell. The animals were 100% pasture raised. They were not mutilated. They did not have their, they weren't, they didn't have their testicles cut off. They weren't, they didn't have to get transported. They had a certain method of killing. That's a higher degree of animal welfare. Is it, is it as good as being a vegan? Which the answer is from an animal welfare standpoint, no. So what? There's Billions of animals in the United States alone every year, we slaughter and eat 10 billion livestock animals in the United States alone every single year. Most of those are chickens. If you included aquaculture or, or, or sea creatures, the number of shrimp that people eat is in the tens of billions a year. So if you think about it, we have like seven and a half people, billion people on the planet, you can get a scope of the numbers of the number of animals that are being slaughtered every year for food, most of them having terrible lives. So most people are not going to become vegans. So improving the welfare is important. Uh, it does drive some animal activists crazy because they think we're apologists for uh, a type of slavery. It's like, don't improve the conditions of the slaves. You need to liberate them immediately. Slavery is wrong. And using animals for food is wrong. So you're lulling people into a false sense of confidence that what they're doing is not somehow or another unethical. And therefore, the animal activists, many of them oppose what Whole Foods is doing uh, as they just want a vegan world and they want it yesterday. And anybody that's not making a vegan world is the enemy. So I've been attacked a lot by animal activists. It's one of these things where, and I feel like we've seen it more and more. I'm, I'm finishing up the, the Jonathan Haidt's book uh, and Greg Lukanoff's uh, The Coddling of the American Mind. And, yeah. and he talk, Yeah, that's on my list. It's really it. good. It's really good. And at one point, he talk, he's talking about trying to understand the behavior that you see on college campuses of this sort of demonization of, of people this sort of mob-like dehumanization. And that's what you're describing is, is um, that when, when anything but perfect purity is evil and therefore you're not part of the tribe. And what he su suggests is that what's going on there, in part at least, is, um, is not necessarily the, the, entirely the desire to achieve the outcome, but to actually have social solidarity in the group that look we are pure and we ha we this is what we want and so that m maintenance of purity is a is just a kind of social good for activists i think it's a, it, it's um i i think it's i agree with that but i also see it in a different way which i see it as um throughout most of history you've always had an elite again 
of intellectuals, what we could call, or what McCloskey calls the clerisy. But in most history, these intellectuals showed up in the religion, and they, that's, that was the path for them. And they would have all, they'd have dietary prohibitions, they'd have speech prohibitions, they'd have all these requirements of how you worship, and if you didn't do it, you oftentimes were killed. And we had in the Enlightenment age, as we liberated ourselves from the traditional religions, we had this, you know, uh, freedom of speech, freedom of thought, freedom of religion, uh, and uh, that's being pushed back against now. And basically, that clerisy, that intellectual class, really wants to control the way people think, the way they eat, the way they worship. Uh, what they can do, what they can say, uh, and uh, so it's coming back, but not in the form of a, of a, of an official organized religion. It's coming back in the form of ideologies such as um, environmental, radical environmentalism, climate change, justifying the worst kinds of tyranny to save the planet uh, from the worst, you know, because we're doomed unless government takes everything over, or. People can't, you can't eat these any things anymore because it's causing damage to the environment. Um, you can't say these things because it hurts people's feelings. So you can't ask somebody out on a date because she takes that as a, she can interpret that as a, uh, as you're, you've had an uninvited sexual advance. So we, we're, 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 they're trying to come up with a whole new set of tyrannical rules for speech action behavior that would rope people in again, just like they were roped in for most of our, of our history. The reality is that when people want to, they want to control other people, control what they eat, what they think, what they say, what they do, whether they can own guns, where they can live uh, their entire lives, what they can say, what they can think. It's a, uh, it's a, uh, it's a very bad trend. It's completely against the Enlightenment philosophy. Uh, and uh, there needs to be pushback. Otherwise, I mean, the campuses have pretty much been taken over by it. And, uh, and yeah, and, I, and then it's, now it's trying to apply it to the rest of society. It's, it's very it's concerning. So to, to, to take us from that, from that side to, a high, to end on a high note, I want to, <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, uh, which I, I share all those concerns and I think they're, they are scary. I and mean, I think, I mean, I've changed schools for my son because uh, I saw this sort of victimology starting to play out in his middle school. And I, who's the biggest victim, whoever is the most, the biggest victim wins. And it's, uh, and the, the Jonathan Haidt book. And um, again, like talks about this, this sort of fallacy of the world is, is, is a battle between good people and evil people. And, but on your cover of your book, and, and we'll end with this, um, you have a spiral. And you introduced me to a concept called uh, uh, by a, a, a philosopher, I guess you could call him, Don Beck, called spiral dynamics. Yeah, mm -hmm. And it seems to have had a real impact on the way you think about the kind of sweeping progress of society. Mm -hmm. what, yeah. Why is that spiral? What does that spiral mean to you? And, and where are we headed in this sort of spiraling evolution um, from your perspective? Basically, uh, and also the work of Ken Wilber and other integral philosophers, Ken Wilber, Steve McIntosh, Carter Phipps, uh, people that have written in detail about that basically consciousness moves in sort of in as a spiral. It's almost, a you could call it a, a stages, but I think a spiral is a better metaphor because um, in a lot of ways evolution seems to move in spirals and so the simplest way to understand it without going into too much depth because it, there's but the three dominant cultural developmental paradigms that exist in the United States that are the root of the cultural wars is one you have and these things both cultures and individ, each individual moves through their own stages of development and the first one is uh, not the first one, but the first one I'm going to mention is what we might call traditionalism, where traditional religions, traditional um, politics, traditional um, lifestyles that have been passed on from generation to generation to generation, um, 
they would be it's and if you assign a color to that you'd call it that's called the blue meme or traditionalism and it's i mean oftentimes seen in small towns seen in evangelical religions or more traditional religions uh and kind of provincialism, provincialism. or conservatism, small c conservatism. Small c conservatism. Yeah, small c conservatism based on, um, uh, you know, family. We've always done it, this, always way. Done it this way. Yeah, and but it's it's a good thing. I mean, th- there's a beauty in traditionalism that we should we should never lose. Even though you may move on to dis- additional places in your in your own evolutionary journey as a person and as a society, but there's a beauty in traditionalism that we need to preserve. And then, but of course, there's a, there's a, there's a dark side, a shadow side to traditionalism, which is a certain a tyranny of thought where you had, uh, you had witch trials and, and uh, uh, um, people weren't allowed, you know, they were just completely controlled. Trade unionists by, burning down your house if you came up with a better way to make shoes. <laughs> Well, I don't want to get into a trade. Or, you know, the old, the old school, the old, like, trade, the, the, yeah, I mean, 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 I'm going back to the guilds, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. exactly. So then with the Enlightenment and with the birth of, of, of reason and, and, and capitalism, we had a, and the United States was a first great example of throwing over the traditionalism to move to a more modernistic uh, a world where we believe that rationality and reason and science and and it, it basically was a rejection of traditionalism to say that I'm not going to take things from authority because a priest says it or because the the president says it or because anybody says it. It's either science supports it, it's either reasonable or it's not. Um, and revolution. revolution. <laughs> exactly. And But it was a revolution of ideas. And there were political revolutions that went along with that, but it was really a revolution of ideas towards reason and uh, liberty and uh, uh, progress. The modernistic age, which uh, is still a very important impulse and still the dominant paradigm in the United States, is is success, achievement, uh, meritocracy. Still this is still creative destruction. Creative destruction. <laughs> yes. And so we'll call that the orange. If we serve a blue for traditionalism, orange for modernism. And then uh, pretty much in the early 60s, on a widespread basis, this had always existed in the past, like with the transcendentalist Emerson, Thoreau, and, and uh, uh, others of that time, we saw a new birth of a new, and, and the, we might call the parts of, of modernism that were were harmful, like uh, the, f- throwing out any type of spirituality um, as superstition and nonsense, uh, logical positivism, reductionism, um, uh, an over reliance on. Um, uh, mm, there was a there was a, the shadow side of modernism is this lack of consciousness and uh, it's it's like um, uh, so the environmental the environmental destruction that was occurring through unfettered uh, industrialism without any checks and balances on it so the counterculture that came up in the 60s was what we could call postmodernist uh, they were began to question well, I I was I was definitely strongly postmodern and uh, uh, it, it was uh, in a counterculture rejection of a lot of the things that were taken for granted in the modernism from from your to be free in the way you remember the 50s was a very conformist time the organization man as people yeah. were just trying to yeah. fit into this uh, uh, the interesting thing is a, is a show like uh, the man in the high castle it's a great example of people uh, there's traditionalism and modernism there. The postmodernism is very not very well developed in that in that in those Nazi. Uh, you Japanese could kind of say, in a way, that socialism, at, at, as def- defined as sort of central planning of the economy and eugenics, are both the kind of materialist modernism taken to its extreme, right? I think so. I think so. Uh, there's nothing that says socialism can't be from a a, a different 
state of consciousness is not, not always from a postmodern state of consciousness at all. And, and Soviet Union was not postmodern in their consciousness. Um, because postmodern really does believe in individualism. It believes in liberty and freedom and, you know, uh, you do your thing, I do my thing. Uh, that was a big part of that, that energy. That energy. Sort of a subjective but, value but, of the world. Now the dark side of postmodernism is manifesting right now with um, the, the hyster environmental hystericism, uh, people becoming hysterical, or the speech codes, the control of the campus, thinking... Uh, those are the, the 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 green skulls, the ones who. Um, so this postmodern is the green meme. Remember, remember there's yeah. this healthy yeah. side of it. Each one of these, what conscious capitalism tries to do, and I might add what, uh, what, working with two of my friends, Steve McIntosh and Carter Phipps, in the next book, The Twelve Virtues of a Conscious Leader, are going to try to do is, we believe there's another. The consciousness wants to evolve to this next level um, in a more widespread way. So when the American Revolution occurred, maybe 10% of the population was modernistic, most were traditionals. And, but that, that core of the, the Thomas Jeffersons and the Washingtons and the Franklins and the Adams and the Madisons, and these guys were, these were definitely modernist. In a, and the United States was the first modernist society. So slavery was definitely a traditionalist institution. That's correct. Slavery, which is condemned, by, well, virtually everybody now, but was seen as quite normal throughout most of history. I mean, it's very well documented. Slavery has been with the human condition, even going back into the Paleolithic times, when you'd conquer another tribe, you'd, if you didn't kill them, you'd turn them into slaves, when you couldn't have that many slaves because you were moving right. around all the time, right. but you had some slaves. And it wasn't, it was modernism that began to break the chains of slavery. Make no mistake about it. Uh, it's modernism that broke slavery, and as the modernist, because modernism believes in the Declaration of Independence, is one of the great uh, modernist documents of all time. I mean, we believe these truths are self-evident. Um, all men are created equal, and you know, the pursuit of happiness is 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 the Declaration says it so well and. Lincoln reaffirmed it with um, his Gettysburg Address when he kind of catched the higher purpose of America in the Gettysburg Address. The Declaration of Independence and the Gettysburg Address both kind of address, I think, the deeper, higher purpose of America, which I hope with another book and that one down the road. But anyway, the integral thinking is one that recognizes all of these various stages in our consciousness. And you do move through these stages as a spiral. Um, they're all valuable and they're all important, and they all have their unique contributions to make. What we can have happen is one of the, one or the other one completely dominate. That we need to see that are, it's okay for people to be in a traditional religion and cling to their guns in religion if that's who they are. What's wrong with that? That's just you know f people freely choosing to follow the ways of their forefathers and not. It should not be condemned. It's they should have, the, but they shouldn't have the right to force that on everybody else either. And modernist, um, if, if you want to be atheistic and you want to be a rationalist and you want to uh, be a reductionist and you don't want believe in all these other things that a postmodernist might believe in, uh, fine, great. Uh, you should be free to do that as well. And, and, but you shouldn't be able to force modernism on everyone else. Same thing with um, postmodernism. Now we're seeing you should, if you think people ought to be more sensitive and they, and they should be vegan or vegetarian or they should be more um, uh, environmentally, environmentally sensitive. sensitive. To intersectionality. <laughs> exactly. That's all free. You want to change your gender? Fine. You know, great. But you shouldn't force everybody else to not be able to say what they think and feel in society just because you don't think it's appropriate. So in a lot of ways, and I would argue is that libertarianism has been associated with uh, modernism, but I have a vision of libertarianism, which has been called by my critics in the libertarian movement as left-wing libertarianism. I don't think that's accurate at all. I would like to think it's more of an integral libertarianism that that recognizes the value of all of these stages of development they're all good they're all valuable they all have toxic elements to it and we need leaders i'm waiting for that political candidate to emerge who i would say is if obama was postmodern 
Trump is is not integral. Trump is a, a modernist. Um, Maybe even a pre-modernist, uh, right? When you say, I think he, I think Trump's a really pretty hardcore sure, modernist. Sure. To be honest with you, um, I don't see him following any traditional religion. Yeah, that's true. He appeals to those people because he knows he can he can speak to that language and and but I don't think I think he's really a modernist and. Uh, uh, but someday we will get a, a leader who's an, inter, an integralist who, who's moved past postmodern has has got traditional elements, mo- modernistic elements, postmodernist elements, and integrated them into a very healthy state of consciousness because that's what we need. Otherwise, until we get that kind of leaders, leader or not, I mean leaders not leader, um, we're going to have these wars going on between the postmodernist, the modernist, and the traditionalist. And the wars are getting, the struggles are getting more and more vicious. And uh, it's, it's, I'm, you know, it's concerning. I think um, in so many ways, when you open that, that new store and you, dis, and you sought out in reverse what, uh, what to call it, and you started with market, and then you said foods, and you landed on whole as the differentiator. In so many ways, I feel like that word whole is a defining uh, attribute of the way you think and the way you see the world. And it's, it's one of the things that's been so um, inspirational to me, John, is that you know your that description of this inter, this integration is a is a it's a holistic. There's a holism to it. We need to, we need to love each other and we need to respect each other and we need to have a little more compassion for people. Stop judging everybody just because they see the world differently than you do. We need more tolerance, we need more acceptance. We need positive visions for how we can make this world a better that place. That fundamental message of of love. You know, my life's been about it's been about creating good things, selling healthy food to people, conscious capitalism, trying to lessen animal suffering, all the things that I'm most passionate about. I've tried to create, I've tried to make the world a better place. And uh, uh, I, there's a lot more work to be done, obviously, but it will have to be done by generations that come after me because I'm, you know, I'm not done yet, but I am, I'm on the last, any way you slice it, I'm on the last third of my life. There's just no way to think of it in any other way. So um, there's more that I want to do, but um, I ultimately have a lot of faith in the creativity of people, and that's one reason I'm optimistic. I do think human creativity is limitless, and despite these challenges that we have, and these, you know, the, we talk about the modernist and the traditionalist and the postmodernist, and there's a lot of things to be concerned about on the planet. The thing that gives me hope is. We're very creative, and I think that we can create, and humans in a lot of ways, are we're our best when we're kind of up against it. When we, when we need to be creative, oftentimes we are, and stress brings out the worst in humanity, but it also brings out some of the best qualities. So this is the best time to be alive despite these challenges that we have. It's not a time to be complacent, but it is a time that we need to continue to create, and uh, I'd like, to, I wish I could pop in a time machine and come back a hundred years from now. I think it'll be as amazing as it is today. It's going to be even more amazing going forward. Thanks so much for spending all this time with me, John. Thanks. I hope you edit this a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> lightly, lightly. Yeah. <laughs> all right, John. Thanks. Thanks for listening to the Emergent Order podcast. If you haven't already, be sure to subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcasting app. If you're interested in being a guest, shoot us an email at podcast at emergentorder.com. Our producer is Jesse Bennett. Thanks again and speak to you next time.